Welcome to the second week of our course. In modern CPUs, there are three main forms of parallelism that we are going to learn to exploit. Multicore parallelism, instruction level parallelism, and vector operations. With multicore parallelism, we make sure that all CPU cores have useful work to do. With instruction level parallelism, we make sure that each CPU core is executing instructions as fast as possible. Finally, with the use of vector operations, we make sure that each instruction does as much work as possible. Last week, we learned to use instruction level parallelism. This week, we will learn about the other two forms of parallelism. In a sense, instruction level parallelism was the easiest form of parallelism for, for us to use. We just arrange our code so that they are independent operations that can be executed simultaneously in parallel. And then magic happened and the CPU parallelized it for us on the fly. The other two forms of parallelism will require a little bit of extra effort from us. To use multiple CPU cores, we must somehow create multiple threads of execution. And the CPU does vector operations only if we explicitly tell it to do so by using special machine language instructions. It's important to note that these forms of parallelism concern very different scales. For example, in multicore parallelism, the threads execute a large number of operations, perhaps millions or billions of operations, while in instruction level parallelism, we might be concerned about parallelizing just a handful of operations somewhere in the most critical part of the innermost loop. Multicore parallelism in CPUs is tightly connected to multi-threading in operating systems. A programmer simply creates multiple threads of execution. Then the operating system simply tells each CPU core to run its own thread. And you can pretty safely assume that the operating system is doing the right thing. If you're running a program that creates four threads on CPU that has four cores and there is nothing else happening in the computer at the moment, then there will be one-to-one -one correspondence between threads and CPU cores. If you create more threads, then the operating system has to resort to some form of time sharing and the extra threads won't give you any extra performance, just extra overhead. And on the other hand, if you have fewer threads, then some CPU cores will simply sit idle doing nothing. Now, how do we split our computation among multiple threads? The obvious answer is that you can create multiple threads using the low-level primitives in your programming environment, and then write some code in which threads communicate with each other and coordinate work sharing. Lots of work and easy to make mistakes. However, there are much easier tools available. OpenMP makes work sharing among multiple threads so easy that it almost feels like cheating. Let's now see how to use OpenMP to distribute long-running computations among multiple CPU cores. Let's start with a very simple example where we want to do some computation C 10 times with different parameter values 0, 1, and so on up to 9. Maybe operation C is some heavyweight simulation that you want to try out with different values of parameters. The naive sequential solution simply calls C in a loop and then we will have one thread of execution that runs first C of 0, then a C of 1, and so on, up to C of 9. 
one CPU core is doing work, all others are idle. Let's just add one OpenMP Pragma directive before the loop. No other changes. Compile the code, run it with a computer with four CPU cores, and see what happens. All of a sudden, we have got four threads of execution, one per CPU core. And the loop is split automatically among the four threads. With very little coding effort, we got almost factor four speedups. There is no synchronization between the threads while they are doing their own work. The first thread will start C of 1 as soon as C of 0 is done. The threads have no idea what the other threads are doing. And this is what makes OpenMP fast. You only coordinate at the beginning and at the end of a loop. However, the beginning and the end are synchronized. Here, function D can safely assume that all the work in the loop is done, just like in the sequential version. Usually, OpenMP splits a loop so that each thread does consecutive iterations. But you can use the schedule directive to change it. You can even switch to a fully dynamic schedule. This usually gives the best balance of workload between the threads. But it only makes sense if each iteration of the loop does a relatively large amount of work. Otherwise, communication overhead will ruin the performance. Now let's put OpenMP in use in practice. Let's return to the sample application that we introduced last week. Here is a naive sequential solution. There's a lot of things going on inside the outermost loop. But for us, it's enough to note that each iteration is independent. It doesn't matter if you do first i is 0 and then i is 1, or vice versa. It doesn't even matter if you do this simultaneously in parallel. So we can safely ask OpenMP to parallelize the outermost loop. And it is really this simple. Compile it, run it, benchmark it, and you get performance improvements almost by a factor of four. We used the most inefficient version as a starting point here, but we can equally well start with a version that already uses a good memory access pattern and instruction level parallelism. And we can just parallelize the outermost loop using OpenMP and we get large performance improvements. So effective use of OpenMP can be as simple as just adding one line. But a lot of care is needed to make sure you really can add this line. Let's carefully check all variables and data items that we are accessing here. First, there is variable v. This is defined inside the parallel section. So each thread is going to have its own private copy of this variable. So different threads are reading and writing their own private variables. No problems here. Second, we have variable n. This is a shared variable. It was defined somewhere outside the parallel section. But no problem, we are only reading it. Many threads reading the same shared variable is fine. And the same holds for the array D. We are only reading it. It's fine. The really tricky part is here. Array R is shared among all threads. And all threads are writing to this array. Now we need to be really careful. But if you think about this, each iteration of the loop writes to different parts of the array. For instance, let n be equal 10. When i is 0, we are only writing to elements between 0 and 9. When i is 1, we are only writing to elements between 
10 and 19, and so on. For each value of i, we write to a different range of array elements. So this is safe. Different threads will never try to write to the same array element. So we are allowed to ask OpenMP to parallelize this loop. OpenMP will be happy to do it and it will work correctly. So exactly what are the rules? Many threads accessing their own private variables is always fine. Many threads accessing some shared read-only data is always fine. You can also have threads writing to different parts of a shared array. But if you ever have a situation in which there is a data element that one thread is reading and another thread is writing without explicit synchronization, you've got a serious bug in your program. And the same holds also if you have some shared data elements that are written by multiple threads. And these are really serious bugs. Your code will compile just fine. You will just start to notice that your program will misbehave in certain situations. It might work on your computer, but not on your customer's computer. And it might misbehave in really strange, unexpected ways. You don't want to have these kinds of bugs. Be careful. OpenMP is a powerful tool. You can do a lot of good with just one line of code, but also a lot of damage. Here we have some simple examples that illustrate these rules. In the first loop, iteration 0 writes to x1, while iteration 1 reads from x1. This would be a data race if you tried to parallelize this with OpenMP. Here, iteration 0 writes to y0, while iteration 1 also writes to y0. Again, a data race if you try to parallelize this with OpenMP. But the last example is just fine. Iteration 0 writes to y0, but nobody else is writing to it or reading from it. Iteration 0 also reads from x0, but nobody else is writing to it. So just add OpenMP pragma, and you have immediately a multicore version of this loop. What we have seen is already enough to get started with our basic OpenMP exercises.